Mondays are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and chair of the New Urbanism Division, and uh, I'm your webcast moderator. Uh, today is Friday, July 22nd, and we will be hearing the presentation Regulating Electronic Message Centers. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in your webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call that 1-800 number shown. And for your content questions related to the presentation, you can type those in the questions box that's uh, in your webinar toolbar, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation uh, during the designated Q&A. Coming up on your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapter APA chapters and divisions for 2016. Thanks to all the participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and uh, free to their members. In particular, today's webcast is sponsored by APA's County Planning Division. You can learn more about this division by, by visiting uh, planning.org slash division slash county planning. Uh, and you can learn about all our divisions at planning.org slash divisions and our chapters at planning.org slash chapters. So thanks to County Planning. Coming up on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. You can register for these by visiting our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And to log your CM credits, for attending today's webcast, just head over to planning.org and log into your MyAPA account. Up at the top, you can uh, search for CM activities. So either type in the event number for today or the title of today's webcast, both of which can be found, again, on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And this webcast has been approved for one and a half CM credits, uh, live viewing only. We do have some recorded webcasts that are available for distance education, and you can check those out uh, and learn how to go ahead and view those by visiting our webcast webpage again, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on our upcoming sessions. We are recording today's webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel. Just uh, head over to YouTube.com and uh, you can search Planning Webcast or YouTube.com slash Planning Webcast. And a PDF will be available of this presentation uh, at the end of the session, again, on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash Planning Webcast. I'd now like to introduce today's speakers and get things rolling. Uh, up first is Mike Freeborg. He, Mike is the Director of Government Relations for PrismView, which is a Samsung-owned company and one of the nation's largest manufacturers of LED message signs. He has been in this role for six years. Prior to this current role, he was Young Electric Sign Company's uh, Denver Division Sales Manager for 10 years. And during his time there, Mike gained in-depth experience with local, regional, and national electronic message sign regulatory issues and was at the forefront of developing educational materials that are now widely used by planners nationwide. And Mike is actively involved at a national level regarding regulatory issues, uh, regarding electronic message signs, and is the current chair of the Digital Sign Research Committee for the International Sign Association. And our, uh, our second speaker today is James Carpentier. James is currently the Director of uh, State and Local Government Affairs with uh, the International Sign Association, ISA. In this capacity, James works with and educates local officials and planners in the creation of reasonable and effective sign codes. Prior to that, James was the owner of Carpentier Consulting, LLC, where he specialized in sign variances, entitlements, and sign legislation. In addition, James was Director of Government Relations for one of the largest and most respected sign companies in the country. James has over 25 years of experience as a certified planner in the public and private sectors, 
He has a bachelor's from the University of Wisconsin Green Bay and master's studies in public administration and urban planning from the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our first speaker, Mike Freeborg, to get us rolling. And Mike, don't forget to unmute yourself if you're talking. Thanks for that friendly reminder. <laughs> and I just want to verify that you can see the screen okay. Everything looks good and you sound good. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody, to today's session on regulating electronic message centers. We certainly appreciate your attendance. Um, just a little bit of background on how the program came to be. Uh, back in uh, uh, late to, in uh, 2008, uh, we have been called to uh, assist the uh, uh, city of Lake of Loveland, Colorado, uh, in dealing with issues surrounding electronic message centers. And when we went up and met with the planner, uh, at that point she had printed out and had assembled about a 10-inch high stack of, of materials. Uh, regarding electronic message centers, she had cobbled together a sample code on electronics and once they reviewed the code, I it was very clear that there were, that she was going to, she and the city were going to run into issues with uh, signs uh, behaving badly with no way to uh, uh, easily enforce uh, proper uh, operation and brightness regulations. So um, it was, uh, it was clear in my mind at that point that definitely additional education was needed on what can be a very confusing topic on electronic message centers. Uh, and uh, also uh, was witnessing other sign companies in town install message centers that were overly bright, uh, figuring that other sign companies needed education on electronic message centers and key elements surrounding uh, their regulation. And also attended a meeting in downtown Denver, Colorado, where uh, when I showed up, it was a Board of Adjustment hearing, and there were uh, about 150 people showing up with red buttons on their lapels and uh, on their sweaters, and uh, I'd never seen anything like that. I've attended a lot of these hearings and never seen anything quite like that. And when uh, uh, it came to when the subject matter of uh, proposed the digital message centers for a mixed-use uh, uh, property in downtown Denver came up, uh, then uh, things got interesting. What was being proposed at this site were static message centers that could only display static colors, like the color orange or the color red at Christmas time, uh, or the color green on St. Patty's Day. Static colors for one hour. The colors had to remain constant without changing for one hour. What was interesting is when the topic came up for public hearing, person after person came up out of the crowd and said, I am against these these Las Vegas type video signs coming to my community, and uh, what was interesting is what was being proposed were digital displays that could only display a single color that had to remain static for an hour, and person after person after person, you can imagine how long this took, because uh, everybody had signed up to talk, and uh, everybody kept saying the same thing. The refrain was again and again the same: "We don't want these Las Vegas." video signs here in our community, these bright, flashy Las Vegas video signs. And uh, when finally the last person got up and said, I'm here on behalf of the homeowners association in this area and everybody who's with me, stand up and show your, show your voice now. And everybody got up and turned on their red buttons. And so there was a sea of blinking red buttons in opposition to the flashing Vegas video signs that were being proposed. So that it was a it was a baseball bat over the head, a figurative baseball bat over the head, just telling me we really need education for everybody, the community at large, the planning community, and even other sign companies on the topic of regulating message centers. So that's some of the background on how this program came to be. So to get us started, uh, when we've presented this um, topic to planners across the country, there are very common questions that appear uh, again and again. Those are what are these electronic signs? How do we strike a balance between their use and community aesthetics? And how do we allow them without looking like Las Vegas or negatively impacting community safety? 
How do we regulate them in ways that are understandable and enforceable, which is a key because uh, no community wants to, uh, as a um, trade-off for allowing these, have to hire tons of additional enforcement uh, people to manage uh, their operation. And also, what is the impact of message centers and regulation of them on the actual users of the displays? So those are what we're going to be covering in today's program. Some key things to know right off the bat, uh, electronic message centers can operate in a broad range of capabilities. They have software that allows the displays uh, to, and the end user to easily control the displays and follow local sign codes very easily, but if and only if the sign codes that are in place are easy to understand. So that is uh, what James and I will be focusing on today, is how can we guide you to some of the key elements um, to focus on when developing sign code in regulating electronic message centers. So what we find in dealing with community after community is if there is a predominant negative sentiment towards electronic message centers in the community, it's, it's usually centered around what we phrase as the that one sign problem. It's that one sign that is too bright, it's too animated, it's too much of something, too Las vegas -y perhaps, or in, if you're out east, it's too uh, Times Square-ish uh, for our community. It's too much of this that would be allowed here. In fact, uh, this can be a sign that's in your community today. It can be a sign in a neighboring community. It can be even a sign in another state uh, that's referenced again and again. Uh, just a little background story on this. Uh, when uh, uh, I worked at the city of Greeley, Colorado, uh, when they uh, were considering revising their regulations on electronic signs, and I, I asked them why they did not allow electronic signs, and the answer was, oh, there was this sign at a rental center, it had these big bright light bulbs, and it was flashing and blinding people, and we just hated that, and we wanted to make sure that that would not happen again. And I said, well, I've driven all over this town, I've never seen that sign. And they said, oh yeah, it hasn't been up for 10 years. So. Uh, this, these sediments are very pervasive, uh, they're very strong, and they can last a long time in a community. Also in Logan, Utah, where actually Prism View's manufacturing facility is, there was an effort in play to ban digital signs uh, a few years ago. And we sat down and met with the various stakeholders from the community and business leaders to discuss the topic. And uh, we started out the conversation by saying, what is it that is leading this effort to try and ban digital signs here in this community. And person, uh, we started out with person number one, and uh, her response was, you know that one sign at the corner of such and such and such and such, oh, that thing, it's, it's that bright blazing beacon of light you can see all the way down the road, oh, I hate that thing. Then we thanked her for her input, went down to the next person who said, yeah, it's that, that same sign, boy, that sign drives me crazy, I hate that sign. And again and again and again, uh, they referenced a blazingly bright uh, box on a stick uh, that was on a prominent corner in town that you could see uh, for quite a ways. And uh, what was interesting about this is that there were 24 digital signs in the city of Logan at the time that this conversation happened. The only sign that was mentioned was the one that was operating too bright. Uh, and you're going to find that brightness is a key item when we talk about regulating electronic signs. So. Um, this, that one sign problem is a very strong emotional uh, impactor in a number of communities. So what we're going to do today to ensure that when you that are on this call uh, start implementing digital sign regulations that you don't end up with a that one sign problem in your community, we're first going to dispel the biggest myths and concerns that drive regulatory decision signs and then we're going to understand and address the six key regulatory distinctions uh, surrounding digital such that if you uh, in your code can get a handle on these six things and make sure that proper guidelines are put in place that are a fit for your community, you can rest assured that you will not have a, that one sign problem in your community. You're going to have signs that uh, people will actually find, actually add and contribute to the community. So with that, uh, let's jump into some of the biggest myths that have historically driven regulatory decisions around digital signs. Uh, number one is, these signs will make our community look like Las Vegas or Times Square if you're out east. Uh, and the reality is there's no comparison. Uh, we'll take a closer look here. Scale is a huge part of this. Uh, this is a graphic of the New York New York sign on the Las Vegas Strip, because when most people are thinking about Las Vegas, 
Uh, it's about the Strip, and obviously Times Square is that several block area that everyone knows about. Everyone sees on New Year's Eve, if nothing else. So uh, this particular sign on the Vegas Strip is 200 over 200 foot tall and has 7,000 square feet of sign area. Uh, just as to help out with the scale here, this individual who is standing right here on the right side of the screen, hopefully you can see my pointer, is standing right at this spot on this sign on the Vegas Strip. So uh, these signs are massive uh, in scale. Here's another sign uh, uh, just down the road, just about a block down the road uh, from the New York, New York sign that's actually several times larger in sign area than New York, New York, 18,300 square foot of sign area. When I ask communities that show up to our in-person, our live sessions, because um, we do hold a number of these signs of success programs around the country uh, each year, when we ask planners, what's the largest sign allowed in your community, very, once in a while we'll get up to around 300 square feet if you're on a freeway uh, in special use situations. So that is about 5%, less than 5% of the total square foot area of even the, of, uh, the large displays in uh, Las Vegas, 5% or less. So scale is a huge factor. I do know brightness is not a consideration on the Las Vegas trip. However, if you've ever been to Las Vegas and driven on arterial streets outside of the strip, you're going to find that there is an extremely different regulatory environment in that area regarding size, brightness, animation, how often it can change, the message can change. So the Las Vegas Strip is its own oasis, but communities again and again fear that if they allow electronic signs that they're going to end up with Las Vegas in their community. So it doesn't have to be that way. Um, Common concern number two is the mere presence of these signs will distract drivers and cause more accidents. The truth is, studies show that there's no causal relationship between these signs and accident rates. There's a distinction between something that is distracting and dangerous, uh, to the point of, and a distraction to the point where it's dangerous and leaving your eyes away from the road for a dangerously long period of time. I've heard um, uh, members of city councils, planning commissions express concern that people will be transfixed by a digital sign along the roadway and uh, they'll just be so eager to see the next message that shows up that they will not pay attention to the roadway and cause accidents. Uh, studies have shown that that is not the case. So there's two main thoughts when it comes to traffic safety, two main tracks of research that have been done in this area. One major tract is surrounding uh, actually measuring accident rates on the on uh, stretches of roadway before the presence of digital signs and after the presence of digital signs to see if accident rates have increased. The second major tract of research, and this is measuring driver behavior, where they actually set up special equipment in a car and measure eye glance patterns um, as someone's driving the car to see if someone is actually getting transfixed and uh, uh, see if that fear of people just locking in on a digital sign holds true. So we'll take a look at those tracks now. So. Again, uh, on the traffic safety tract, uh, there was a study done by Dr. Gene Hawkins called Statistical Analysis of the Relationship Between On-Premise Digital Signage and Traffic Safety, done by Gene Hawkins, again, of Texas A&M University. Uh, this was released a few years ago, I believe 2012. And uh, they studied data over a four-year period at 130 locations in four states. The key finding uh, is that they did not find a statistically significant impact to indicate that accident rates increased after the presence of digital on roadways. So they measured accident records before the installation of digital and after to see if there was an increase. They did not find a statistically, statistically significant impact. And if, you're, if uh, you wish to uh, peruse the entire study, you can find it at this link. Okay. Measuring, uh, heading down the other track of driver performance, uh, Virginia Tech Traffic Institute, which is what VTTI stands for, uh, they did a study uh, titled Driving Performance in Digital Billboards, back, dating back to 2007. Uh, participants drove in an instrumented vehicle on a 50-mile loop in Cleveland. They were not informed about the true purpose of the test. Uh, they had special equipment in the car that you can see uh, here in these pictures that measured eye glance patterns towards digital billboards and other comparison targets like buildings, landmarks, uh, uh, static signs. And again, the goal is to measure the duration of eye glances towards these targets, uh, primarily focusing on how long the eye glance pattern was towards digital uh, billboards. 
the key findings were, um, and I, I put this graph up here indicating that uh, the NTSB had uh, determined that a dangerous level of distraction was determined if someone, uh, if something was happening to cause someone's eye glance to look away from the roadway for over a two second period of time, that was considered to be a dangerous level of distraction. So uh, with that as our baseline, the key findings in this uh, study was that the mean glance duration towards digital billboards was actually less than one second both day and night, so far less than what the NTSB had declared as a dangerous level of distraction. In contrast, Virginia Tech Traffic Institute did um, also perform what was known as uh, what became the study in terms of determining texting while driving, uh, whether or not that was a, uh, uh, a dangerous activity to do while driving. That was found to distract someone for up to 4.6 seconds during a six second period while driving, so far off the charts, which is one of the main reasons why uh, Virginia Tech recommended that governments um, on a state level ban texting while driving. So uh, this same institute did that study. So. Okay, the, the recently, and now recently, it's actually a little, uh, it's over two years ago, but the Federal Highway Administration did release a study uh, that had a similar tract uh, as the Virginia Tech study, which it measured, again, the possible effects of digital billboards on driver attention, distraction, and safety. Their approach was very similar to Virginia Tech, where they put cameras in cars, and uh, that release date, again, was the end of 2013. So the main findings from that study was again that the mean eye glance was far less than one second, so very similar to Virginia Tech study. And the mere presence of changeable electronic variable message centers did not appear to be related to a decrease in looking toward the road ahead. And uh, the results did not provide evidence indicating that message centers as deployed and tested in the two cities uh, were associated with unacceptably long glances away from the road. So this is this study was founded by your tax dollars. So. Um, so that uh, um, I hopefully fairly resolutely uh, put a cap on the concern about uh, whether or not these digital signs constitute a traffic safety hazard. So both from accident record and driver behavior standpoints, no such findings have been found. Common concern number three, if we do allow these signs, we should require long message hold times in excess of one minute because that is the only way our community will avoid looking like Las Vegas and it's the only way they will tolerate these signs. The truth is that a community's negative emotional reaction is almost always more associated with improperly regulated brightness. Brightness, if you're going to get complaints on signs, uh, it's 19 out of 20 times it's going to be associated with brightness, not how often a message changes, just from our experience. So as a way to demonstrate this, it's very, very effective when you're talking about this in your communities to use hold time examples because sitting around a table just saying, you know what, I think we should have a hold time of mm, five minutes. And then somebody else is like, no, I think three minutes is more appropriate. It just, it's, it doesn't provide a great basis to have a functional conversation. So we recommend using hold times in your communities, examples. So. Uh, it's a very difficult regulatory distinction to discuss without use of visual tools. So what I'm about to show you is what a 30 second hold time looks like starting now. you should have just seen the message change. So that is an example of what 30 second hold time looks like. Um, interestingly enough, when we, uh, I was in Colorado Springs and we were discussing hold times with an event center down there, we were meeting with city officials with the management group with the event center. The event center said, hey, we only have a limited amount of square footage to work with for a message center. Uh, we, uh, you know, we have, the event itself, who's sponsoring the event, uh, you know, uh, what, how to get tickets, things like that that we need to display, and there's just not enough room on the message center to show it, so we need to rotate through messages fairly quickly. Well, the city said, the city uh, said, well, 
we think uh, you should be able to change the message once every hour, and that should be good enough. And the, the manager of the event center said, listen, you know, again, we have all these things to rotate through. If somebody drives by, we'd like to at least communicate a couple of frames of information. And then the city said, well, you know, after, after a good 45 minutes of discussing this, we ended up at five minutes. And uh, the, the, the management group was very frustrated because they knew that the sign was not going to allow them to function and communicate what was happening at the event center. We created an animation, showed it to the Board of Adjustment, and we ended up at seven seconds. Um, so you, the power of a visual is a very strong way to communicate uh, the needs uh, associated with being able to rotate through different content. So here's an example, actually, of what a 10-second hold time looks like. Okay, so, so once every 10 seconds, you can see this is far from a Las Vegas-like effect or a Times Square effect. We're not seeing dancing bunnies or flashing graphics here. We're just seeing change from one frame of content to another frame of content. Uh, it certainly allows the message center to be uh, more fun functional for the user if they can communicate at least two frames of content to someone driving by. So. Uh, that is uh, message hold time. So again, we recommend uh, showing different examples in your communities. And again, these videos, if they are not currently available, will be available in the next day or so uh, at uh, this website. Uh, we recommend them for internal staff discussion, planning commission, city councils, and they're going to save you a lot of pain and agony. Okay. Uh, and uh, we also encourage you to consider other factors like allowable sign size, setbacks, uh, sign size and setbacks when discussing hold times uh, as well. Okay, so common concern number four is message centers are way too bright. They will shine in people's living rooms and cause accidents, etc. The truth is, actually, only in properly regulated message centers are way too bright. Uh, there are now well-established guidelines that address this issue, and uh, you can adopt these guidelines, and you will not have dancing lights in your living room. Um, so, uh, just a brief story on uh, this uh, in the. Uh, um, uh, actually, you know, we'll get to some brightness slides and I'll tell you a little story here in just a minute here. So, uh, some planning and zoning considerations associated with brightness. Let's get to this. We mentioned that there are six of these. The first one is brightness. Uh, on this topic, how bright a sign really is is actually quite relative. Uh, an electronic sign that looks perfectly normal uh, in Times Square would be a bright blazing beacon of light on a dark country road. Conversely, a message center on a dark country road, and some of you may be in horror at such a thought, but actually you can have a digital sign functioning and looking very similar. Uh, in fact, it will look less bright to your eye if regulated properly than an internally illuminated sign, static sign would be on a dark country road. But if you have a properly lit sign message center on a dark country road, it could look like it was malfunctioning in Times Square. So uh, how bright is appropriate is relative. There are generally two different uh, methods towards regulating brightness. One is to measure a sign, uh, or is a luminance, which is measuring uh, brightness in foot candles. The meters are fairly inexpensive, less than $100, and uh, this is uh, easy to check and enforce. There's another methodology that was prominent for a number of years. In fact, several of you on this call may have this regulation in place in your community today. This is regulating by NITS, otherwise known as candelas per square meter. Uh, these meters are actually quite a bit more expensive. They're approximately $3,000, and this has several pitfalls associated with enforcing this, so which uh, we'll discuss shortly. Okay. Uh, the ISA's recommended brightness guide, as I mentioned before, there are established guidelines in place. Uh, this is the cover sheet of the recommended of the current uh, recommended brightness levels for on-premise message centers, a piece created by the International Sign Association. Uh, these guidelines were developed by Dr. Ian Lewin a number of years ago. He's a renowned lighting expert with over 30 years of experience in lighting science. Uh, they were developed solely for message centers and are not applicable for traditional signs. To date, and this figure is about six months old, but over 170 jurisdictions have adopted these guidelines, including eight state departments of transportation, most recently Colorado uh, in February, I believe, of this year. So these guidelines are being recognized for their ease of measurement, uh, their uh, ease of understanding, 
uh, and um, uh, they are they do not take a big staff to uh, uh, to enforce this this guideline. So very effective. A couple of key findings uh, from a couple of key items associated with these guidelines. Number one is auto dimming is a must. All message centers. Uh, we recommend this guideline be put into your code. All message centers shall be equipped with technology that automatically dims the message center according to ambient light conditions. Uh, the primary brightness guideline in, this, in the code is as follows. A little bit wordy, but it's important to understand. To ensure that message centers are sufficiently visible but not overly bright, it is recommended that message centers not exceed 0 0.3 foot candles over ambient lighting conditions when measured at the recommended distance based on the message center size. There is a formula for that distance, incidentally. Basically, the test goes like this. You, take, you stand a prescribed distance away from the sign based on the size of the message center with the sign off. You take a measurement using a foot meter of the ambient light in that area. Then you turn the message center on, displaying all white. All white represents it as bright, the, the brightest the sign can be because the red, green, and blue diodes are all firing at the same time. You then take another measurement if the difference between the first measurement and the second measurement exceeds 0.3 foot candles, the sign needs to be dimmed until it meets, until it passes the test. Okay. So just as a as a kind of a general guide, another way of looking at this, uh, you see a picture of a sign that is obviously operating far too bright at night. It creates this halo effect around the sign. Uh, signs that look like that to your eye at night are operating far in excess of the recommended brightness guidelines. They're operating 30% or higher, generally, to create that effect. The result of the international, uh, of the ISA guidelines are that the sign is going to operate between 3 and 7% of its maximum brightness capability at night. Okay. Uh, any lower than that, and the sign can become a little murky, a little dark, and a little difficult to read. Uh, some environmental groups have proposed regulation that would steer message centers towards operating in this area, which we think is a negative. Again, we want it to be bright enough to be legible, but not too bright, such as to create a glare for motorists or passersby or residents nearby. Okay. Also, several communities have considered daytime brightness regulation on these signs, and uh, we uh, just don't find that to be effective. Uh, for instance, if we're taking a look at regulating what a lot of folks, what a lot of communities are trying to regulate signs during the daytime have steered towards is NIT-based regulation. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why this does not work really well. For instance, uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, that, uh, that is not uh, the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that is another Pittsburgh, which James can comment on, but uh, this, uh, this sign is set at 2,500 nits at night or during the daytime. So you can see 2,500 nits, the, the guideline of 2,500 nits is just, it creates a sign that's not legible. In comparison, if I I, I have taken a knit gun and pointed at a building, for instance, the, the stonework above this sign, and I've had knit ratings in excess of 10,000 nits, uh, 13,000 nits, even as high as 21,000 nits by pointing it at buildings. And so if I, and incidentally, message centers cannot be created to be brighter than 9,000 nits in the daytime. So. By trying to regulate message centers, you're trying to put a cap on something that can't be made as bright as reflected light off of a building. It's, it's, it's solving a problem that is not there, is the main point. So that is one of the reasons why we don't recommend daytime brightness controls. Okay, uh, uh, so uh, moving on from brightness, regulatory issue number two, message hold time. Again, this is how long a message must remain fixed before it can transition to another message. Uh, it's important to understand the business impact. The shorter the hold time, the more beneficial it is for the user or business. It allows them to cast a wider net. For instance, if I'm driving by a Burger King and I'm a vegetarian and they show a big juicy burger, I'm probably not a customer. But if they're advertising brand new mandarin orange salad, suddenly I am a potential customer. So it also provides the ability to communicate sequential messages, like we talked about the event center of directions or event times or things like that. This is a prime example. Here is a sign for Lone Tree Elementary in Colorado. What I, what I ask people in live sessions is what kind of message, if the message, let's say the whole time here is a minute, what kind of message is the black vehicle driving this sign getting? That there's something going on from 1130 to 140, but you just will know, you'll not know what it is because you're going to be by the sign. 
So especially if you have limited, a limited canvas with which to convey a message, allowing a user to rotate at least through two frames of content should provide enough uh, of uh, movement there, enough of uh, information to, con to convey a functional message to the user. Okay. Uh, so we, we uh, would offer to please consider what problem you're trying to solve before regulating hold times. And again, rec one thing to consider is retroactively regulating this area may create legal issues. For instance, if you don't have hold times in your community today, and if I am a business owner, if I bought a small sign figuring that I could scroll through messages, uh, I saved money because I bought a smaller sign that could rotate through content. But if you force, if you retroactively put in place a long hold time of let's say 30 seconds or a minute or whatnot, this can create issues because you essentially rendered the sign for all intents and purposes useless. So that's just something to consider before retroactively enforcing hold times. Uh, from a safety concern perspective regarding hold times, again, we've already discussed that message centers do not constitute a traffic safety issue. Okay. Uh, the third regulatory uh, distinction to have in place in your code is regulating transition method. This is how a message transitions from one message to the next. So uh, we're going to show you a couple different flavors of transitioning. Uh, again, we recommend using visual examples to discuss in your community. So this is level one, which is static transitions. So can you, you can see there's an instant transition to the next message. Okay, hopefully that's fairly self-explanatory. Level two involves fade and dissolve between content. Okay, level three involves like PowerPoint transitions. I don't know if this will translate well via go-to webinar, but you can see a variety of different ways of transitioning from one piece of content to another. Okay. And level four involves full motion video or content. What you, this is what you'd see in Times Square, uh, Las Vegas, or in other entertainment districts around the country. Okay, so that is uh, transition method. Some regulatory considerations after evaluating options, we encourage you to have a discussion about what works best in your community. And you may want to consider that different regulations in different districts may be appropriate. For instance, in a downtown pedestrian-oriented entertainment district, maybe you allow animation Whereas uh, when you get away from that, uh, perhaps if you're in a general commercial district with just vehicular traffic, you uh, adopt some degree of hold time there. And then if you're in residential, uh, then perhaps that's a longer hold time. So maybe consider different regulations based on zoning districts. Uh, and there's, depending on which level you deem appropriate in your community, there are definitions available in model code language that James is going to discuss that you can adopt uh, uh, there are great definitions there, and we strongly encourage definitions in your code. Okay. Um, what regulatory distinction number four is transition duration. This is how long it takes to get from one frame of content to the next. Some regulatory considerations are we recommend you keep this transition uh, to one second or less to minimize community complaints. In the instant transition from one message to the next, again, that is far less than one second. It's just happening instantly, so some communities keep it simple by saying you have to instantly transition to the next message. So, But it's good to specify this out to avoid the here's welcome to our big sale, this kind of message that builds up over a 20-second period of time that, tend, that can uh, be uh, uh, less favorable in many communities. Okay. Regulatory issue number five is the area of a message center. You need to specify how large, how much of the sign area that's allowed can be message centers. So, some jurisdictions choose to limit the square footage of the message center differently than static signs. I apologize, there's a train going by where I'm at if you're getting that noise. <laughs> uh, I can certainly hear it very clearly, so I hope you're not getting that same sound. Um, uh, back to the area of the message center, some communities very strongly restrict the size of the message center allowed in comparison to the total sign area allowed for a given business. This is often a result of a that one sign concern. So some other considerations regarding size, we would encourage you not to punish someone for having a message center. So basically uh, what some communities have done is they've employed regulations saying, okay, if you want a message center, then you're actually only allowed 50 total square feet of sign areas compared to 100 if you have just a static sign. So we would encourage the size 
the size requirements for overall signage not change, not be punished for having electronics. Uh, but again, you may want to uh, vary the allowable uh, square footage based on the zoning district. Again, in more uh, entertainment districts, you may want to be a little more lenient, whereas you, when you get into re, uh, uh, residential areas, be more restricted. Here are some examples. Some communities choose to regulate size of message centers based on percentage of square footage allowances. So uh, on the message center on the left, you can see that the total the message center is the bottom 25% of this sign. Uh, here, when you take into account the square footage area in the middle one of uh, the University Townsend area plus the tenant pile area below, this, the message center is about 50% of the square footage area. Here it's 75% on the right. And then uh, kind of an interesting uh, note here, here's an example of about 66% of the total area allowed to be electronics here. But one thing to consider is if your community only allows small signs to begin with, you may want to be very flexible either on hold times or uh, on square footage allowance because as we already went through with this example earlier, it's just tough to convey a lot of image when you have a small canvas to work with. And on regulatory issue number six, here we're going to pass it off to James Carpentier to discuss uh, Reed versus Gilbert considerations. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, James Carpentier here. And what I'm going to talk about next is the regulatory issues with the uh, Reed versus Town of Gilbert, which I I'm not, we don't have time to go in a lot of detail in relation to that uh, U.S. Supreme Court case, which is really impacting uh, almost every jurisdiction in the country. And the one th the one tenant of um, this U.S. Supreme Court decision that uh, is very clear is content neutrality is um, should really be the mainstay of sign regulations at this point. Uh, even though this decision did deal with um, temporary uh, non-commercial signage, we suggest and a number of other um, professionals and attorneys throughout the country suggest content neutrality, which should really be maintained uh, throughout the entire code as a result of this decision. So a number of communities in the past have limited electronic message centers as far as color limitations and maybe just numbers and letters, uh, alpha, alphanumeric limitations, and, uh, and the sequential messaging, which, which Mike talked about. Um, so the, the thing to, to lean more towards, rather than um, content regulation with electronic message centers, as, as we recommend uh, for all sign regulations, is just the, the time, place, and manner type of restrictions, which has been a uh, the mainstay really for sign regulation for a number of years. So uh, the where, when, and how, the standard type of regulations, you know, the setback, size, uh, where, without uh, any um, indication on what should be on, on that sign is strongly, strongly recommended. Uh, next slide. And, the, and Mike really talked about this quite a bit. Restrictions can almost always come from that one sign concern. And I think um, to try to move away from that, um, I think the approach that is suggested and is often done in sign codes is to consider you know, the zoning district or if there's um, you know, an overlay district, um, you know, is it appropriate for the, the sign area, which was demonstrated with a different percentage of 75 and you know, 50 and 66 percent, th th that needs to change based upon a district. Uh, you know, uh, and, it, and there's some districts, um, such as uh, maybe you have a historic overlay, and sometimes it just doesn't quite fit because of uh, the, the type of district like that. Um, and, and the key is in relation to the regulations, and I'll, I'm going to drive it home just because of the importance of it is the, um, the brightness. When that's properly regulated, we see very few complaints in relation to how these digital signs operate because uh, if it's too bright, it doesn't matter what it does. It's just going to be a, a, a nuisance um, and something that we, um, we just don't want to see. Um, next, please. And a, a number of jurisdictions will have some type of um, say distance required from resident, residential, often it'll be like the community church sign that you're looking at now. And in this case, it's uh, uh, 200 feet um, 
or 150 feet to the adjacent lot, which is probably a good idea um, to have and consider some reasonable separation. But what this does demonstrate too is that um, the brightness of these signs is really going to be very similar to a static sign if they're following the ISA recommended brightness limitation. So it's really not going to cause um, a lot of conflict in relation to the, being adjacent to residential when it's, when it's properly properly illuminated. And, it, and there is a reasonable setback in this case. Um, you know, it could be 100, 150, or 200 feet, a reasonable offset to that residential district. And, um, and operationally, sometimes communities will say after a certain time, especially if it's adjacent to residential, maybe it doesn't operate past 10 or, or 11 p.m., which um, is a reasonable restriction. Uh, next, Mike. And this is the case with uh, any sign regulation that's being changed. It's a real critical portion of a sign code update in any jurisdiction. It's to really engage the end users, businesses, um, users, groups, uh, residents as much as possible very early on. And often they can identify uh, problems and issues and concerns that they have uh, before you don't want to hear about those at a public hearing. You really want to try to flush out these issues very early and figure out, um, you know, what's going to work in your community and what's going to, what's going to, what's a, what's aesthetically going to, going to fit in with your community. And the visualization, the the videos that Mike showed earlier on the um, change rate or the hold time. Um, these types of tools are really good to show to your stakeholder group your, um, and the commission or council so that they really have an understanding as far as um, what you're talking about. And early on, I think the education is uh, key to, to coming up with regulations that, uh, number one, are understood by everybody because often uh, when you bring say you're bringing a code to commissioner council, there's a lack of understanding, you know, and a lot of these types of uh, tools that we, we have and are available at that link that Mike showed earlier really uh, assist with the education process a lot. And the studies that, that we have, uh, same thing there, and also with the economic studies to incorporate as much of the studies and, and the economic studies, which we'll, we'll uh, talk briefly about in a little bit. Uh, next. Initiating change, often we'll, we'll find that there's a business um, or it could be a church that will um, want to have an electronic message center and they'll get the ball rolling. We suggest to take a proactive approach prior to that happening and, and involve the community to find out, um, you know, what, what are the issues, what would, what would fit in your community, what would they um, be concerned about in relation to electronic message centers. and um, you know, engage all these stakeholders um, early on and throughout the entire process. Next, please. And throughout the process, if you address the concerns, the six regulatory issues that, that Mike talked about, it will really, um, you'll be addressing everything that needs to be regulated in relation to electronic message centers and the, the issues that we've seen throughout the country. And you will be massaging those in a way that it will fit in your community. You know, and you'll be dealing with um, what you've heard from the stakeholders and, um, and, and any others in relation to developing your regulations so that they are uh, unique to your, your community and fit in. And, uh, Another important part of this, and we've talked about it uh, maybe indirectly a little bit, is context in relation to electronic message centers. It's critical that, say, you have a form-based or some overlay district, um, that the regulations fit um, each one of those districts or each one of those overlays in a way that um, um, does not create any any conflict with with any um, um, either guidelines that you may have, which isn't real typical. Sometimes there's, and it's real typical not to have um, overall uh, guidance in relation to signage from a, 
uh, a land use planning perspective, but clearly that's that's got to be a, a piece of the regulations that if you do have any design guidelines or any other policies that it fits in clearly. Um, and sometimes, you know, I would suggest if you don't really have any policies in relation to signs, you could develop those as you go too, and um, which which is more often than not, but if, if you do, clearly you've got to tie those in with whatever regulations you have anyway. Next. And I've seen time and time again a number of communities will adopt what's next door, and almost um, every time those regulations are usually out of date and just don't apply to, um, and just don't fit in, in with your community anyway on top of that. And we do have um, a number of resources that are available um, in relation to um, illumination and some other um, model type of language that will really get you going in the right direction that will provide the guidance that, uh, that at least has been tried um, and true in relation to illumination. I know Mike mentioned 170, that it's probably higher. And I know it's, uh, it's well over 200 now states and that have adopted those elimination standards. Another option, especially for electronic message centers, is um, to consider some type of affidavit to be signed by the, uh, typically by the owner, because the owner is the one that will be operating that sign, unless it's a national chain, like chain, such as um, Walgreens or something like that, which has a central location. But if it's a, a typical electronic message center, um, to have an um, affidavit signed by the applicant and or um, owner of the sign, it, it really assists with, with, with enforcement because what this affidavit would say is that they've received the code, they know what's required, and they agree to abide by it. And if they don't, they may be subject to um, fines or some type of action by the community. So I think that can be an important thing, just given the variability and the, the ease in changing um, the operations of, of the sign. Once um, everyone knows what's required, I think that, that helps them to understand at least what's required. And you'll have um, um, a much higher compliance. And enforcement will be less of an issue with uh, having one of those procedures in place. Next. And it's important enough, I'm just going to mention again, uh, that um, avoid the color-based or text-based regulation. And in addition, due to not only First Amendment and the uh, Supreme Court case Reed, but also the, the Lanham Act and, and trademark infringement, which essentially protects um, any trademarks from being altered in relation to what's displayed on a sign. Next. And this is one piece that is not typically done, but I think it's a really good idea to engage one of your local sign companies and take a look at your regulations and put them on paper with uh, a couple, two or three different types of signs in different districts to see how it would actually look. And how, and if, because what looks good on paper may not always translate well to the real world. So I think that's a, a piece that I highly recommend, and I'm sure you wouldn't have any trouble on getting cooperation from a, a local company to, to, to assist with that. Next. So now we're going to look at the impact on um, electronic message centers on the end users. So, so this is a case study done by University of Cincinnati a few years ago on understanding the economic value of on-premise signs, and it was done uh, in 2012. And a, one part of the study is, is uh, they, they took a look at a car dealer in relation to installation of the electronic message center at that location and what it did for that uh, business. Next. And this was a car dealer outside of Kansas City. He added an EMC back in 2011 with the goals to increase sales and en enhance the reputation in the community and also to um, the strategy was 70% advertising and also he agreed to have 30% civic type of uh, and community type of promotion 
And what this sign did for that business is increase sales by 30% and increase service work by 80%. So I think that um, just from a process standpoint, this piece of electronic message centers is typically not a part of the discussion. And I strongly recommend that um, in relation, when it comes to the review and the impacts of LEDs, that the impacts in, in just go beyond the clearly, we know that they can have a, a challenging impact in relation to brightness and how they operate. But I think that this should be brought into the discussion because the only reason why an end user or a business would like an LED sign, because they're, you know, they're fairly expensive, is because the return on investment can be very good and it can have a real positive impact. Um, but typically when an ordinance goes to council, the one piece that they look at is the economic impact of this code or this ordinance on the city's budget. I, su I suggest that be expanded to take a look at the impact of um, a sign ordinance, in this case an LED or uh, electronic message center ordinance on the, on the community itself. So, next please. All yours, Mike. The, uh, the main part I want to bring up uh, on this slide is one of the main benefits, economic uh, uh, benefits for end users on, is in a multi-tenant retail application. Uh, the uh, this is one prime example. On the left hand side you have 20 tenants uh, displayed in what we would characterize as a functionally invisible way. A way to test that is in live sessions uh, those of you, uh, we often ask uh, participants to on the left hand image uh, see how long it takes you to find an enterprise rent a car. So I'm just giving you a few seconds to do that. There's probably still several of you that have not found it yet. It's half. It's a little more than halfway down on the left-hand side. Uh, the, the that's the tough part about what has been a traditional way of doing multi-tenant signs. Jam all the tenants on there at once. They're, they're, the good news is they're on the sign 100% of the time, but it, they're also functionally invisible. It's very very hard to find these tenants. I mean, you you are sitting at a computer screen trying to find these tenants, but yet imagine trying to navigate this while driving at 30, 40, 50 miles an hour and taking action to safely either change lanes and or enter the center. So on the right-hand side is actually that same side that is retrofitted with uh, functional large readable panels with brand identity for the largest leaseholders in the center but the bottom 25% rotates through all the other tenants, giving them at least functional visibility for a percentage of the day, which makes all the difference. So gives the message center option, the revised one on the right, gives better visibility to all tenants in the end. It makes the sign easier to read, and it certainly has demonstrated to make shopping center space more marketable. So back to you, James. Thanks, Mike. Now, this is a video that was done in Centennial, Colorado, and unfortunately it's audio, so we cannot show the, the video now, but we will have it available at the link that you see, sign.org slash planners. And what this video is is a discussion by some of the community leaders and some businesses located in Centennial that discuss the the positive economic impact these signs have had um, on, on Centennial, Colorado. Next. And I think another piece that's uh, important is to look beyond just the um, A single business is what are the community at large benefits for electronic message centers. And, and clearly they can and do increase uh, sales tax revenue and, and, and tax base. And they can reduce um, blight by making a businesses and a, a, a center way more viable and um, have a, way, a much higher occupancy rate given the effectiveness of electronic message centers for those types of users. 
And another big thing too is that it, it can and does reduce sign clutter since um, a business can have their name out on the street that can be easily read. Um, and in some cases, if they're located in a center with multiple tenants, that this doesn't happen. Or they, the, so it puts someone on the street that um, in a number of scenarios where, where they're just not there given their location or lack of visibility. And they really do um, make unreadable signs more readable and more legible. And they certainly look better than the static reader boards that you see that are usually falling apart or maybe missing a keyword or letter. And they can communicate uh, public service announcements, which a number of end users, um, oftentimes they will do that just to um, um, be a good community uh, neighbor. And um, the other piece, too, in relation to public type service announcements is that uh, uh, they can um, also notify AMBER alerts. Uh, there's some, I believe Walgreens is tied in with that system, um, and any end user can get tied in with, with um, or not only with that system, but they can get tied in with a local um, law enforcement if they so desired, if there were uh, any desire for information that they they need to um, due to an emergency or something like that where they could notify the community. And they, you know, and they could be a symbol of community vitality because they do a, a lot of uh, a lot of the positives that we just talked about, um, and it could be viewed as something that's a, 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 a real positive and a uh, economic um, tool to help assist uh, a jurisdiction. Next. Yeah, interesting, if I can just one just note on that bottom sign, uh, that's actually a sign in Parker, Colorado. And when we asked the city manager a little over a year after it went up, we asked what the impact of the sign was, because all they put on there is different community events. And she said that attendance at the various events had doubled. So not only can they be a symbol of vitality, but they help made the community more involved in the events that were actually happening. So. Okay, so now we're going to answer some questions. We, the, there is one question we have in relation to uh, billboards, and we may not have been real clear early on that the discussion that we're having in relation to electronic message centers, our association, International Sign Association, is, represents the on-premise sign industry and this discussion was focused on and we discussed on-premise signs. There are a number, I'll just indicate that there clearly are jurisdictions that look to exchange existing non-conforming billboards with uh, new digital billboards, but that's really a separate discussion and I can't go into detail about that. Um, so that is common, that is common practice. Well, there, there's one question that is asking about uh, energy in relation to electronic message centers versus um, in comparison to neon, and it could also be in comparison to other methods of illumination. Did you have any uh, comments on that, Mike? I'm sorry, James, could you please repeat the question? Sure, there was a question in relation to energy usage with electronic message centers uh, in comparison to NEON and that... Um, uh, in comparison to NEON, it's a little tough. It's a little like uh, uh, comparing... Uh, it's it's not even like uh, apples and oranges. They, they are... It a lot depends on... Uh, what kind of area we're talking about and message that there's just a totally different illumination type. I will say this, um, the, um, the 
a free, um, like I, it's hard to say, an LED sign of X amount of size would be one third of a neon lit sign of a certain area. They're just very, very different um, lighting methodologies. The, um, but I will say this in terms of uh, LED technology, the roadside digital billboards that you see uh, on a freeway now consume less than 100 amps of service and that is, um, uh, that is, a lot of you may not be familiar with uh, electricity or whatnot, but that is actually a pretty, uh, pretty low number for that size of sign. A typical roadside sign uh, that for a car wash that is say, uh, you know, six foot tall by 10 foot wide would maybe have a power bill per month uh, in the uh, 15 to 20 dollar range. Um, so they just don't consume that much power. Okay, thanks, Mike. And and then just to expand on that, there's another question that talks about a, a traditional illuminated sign versus um, electronic message center as far as um, energy usage. A uh, message center sign will use uh, more power than uh, much more power than a static sign during the daytime because a static sign in the daytime has the face of the sign that communicates the message with the sign doesn't have to be turned on uh, at all. So a message center to be read actually is has to have light emanating from it in the daytime. In fact, that's when it's operating at its brightest. And so that's when it uses the majority of its power is in the daytime. At night, uh, the, it flips to where the message center sign would usually be dimmed to between 3 and 7 percent, excuse me, of its maximum potential brightness. And a uh, static sign now to, needs internal illumination to be visible and actually will consume several times more power during the nighttime hours than would an electronic message center. So, it's hard to say, okay, uh, when it all balances out the, the power equation, what's more expensive to run uh, when you combine both day and nighttime hours? It kind of it depends on the lighting technology and the sign. More and more cabinet signs are being illuminated with LEDs and not fluorescent or HID lamps. So even static signs at night are consuming very, very little power. And they have far fewer LEDs than a message center would. So it's, uh, that story is ever-changing as we speak. Okay, thanks, Mike. Next question deals with digital gas sign uh, price signs uh, in relation to EMC signs, which is a good question. We would suggest um, that you, as a jurisdiction, not specifically regulate the price signs since that's content, rather just regulate the size that's allowed um, for that type of type of user, because anytime you're you're having to essentially look at the sign to determine compliance that is not content neutral and you'd have to look at if you had um, a specific guidelines for a price digital uh, price signs uh, you'd be running a, a file with the uh, Supreme Court case so I would just be totally content neutral and how you regulate that but that's a good question And there's another question in relation to um, why, why should a community that only permits business ID and address for on-premise signage, should they even allow for EMCs? Well, that's another read issue. I would say that um, the requirements there should not indicate that only the business ID, the address is okay, because that's kind of a safety thing, but uh, only permits certain information on that sign is something that sounds like it runs afoul of uh, the read decision and I would stay away from from anything that um, that talks about the content of a sign and here's another really this is a good question should non EMC signs and uh, inter internally illuminated signs be regulated by the same uh, guidelines in relation to illumination and no, the, the electronic message center illumination guidelines that have been established are designed for electronic message centers only and it does not translate to internally illuminated signs. 
And we find that um, we do not have specific recommended guidelines for illuminated signs. I mean, in relation to how they're constructed, I mean, as, as Mike mentioned, it's changed a little bit in relation because uh, it's going what, much more to um, to LED. But in, in, the, in relation to how they're built, there's a lot of standardization in the industry. And we don't find illumination of traditional science to be a huge regulatory issue. And um, I, I could certainly talk to someone more uh, in more detail offline about that as some thoughts, but I don't think we have time to go into to the details. Oh, there, I think there was an assumption that we that there's a requirement for PSA public service announcements, and we weren't suggesting that. This was a voluntary, I believe, I'm not sure, a part of um, the car dealer, but from a regulatory standpoint, we would not encourage or require that PSAs be a part of a regulation. Because um, yes, that would be um, I'm headed in the direction of content, content regulation, but not directly. Um, but it's, it's something that we would recommend you avoid. And there's a, another question in relation to LEDs over neon. Um, we don't recommend one thing over another. We suggest um, flexibility in relation to how sign regulations are developed to give end users a, a little bit of latitude. And I, one thing I can say in relation to neon, it has gotten a bad rap in the past because there were issues that go way back in relation to safety and, and there's a lot less um, energy usage with uh, new electronic ballast with neon. The energy use is, is quite a bit less than it used to be. Um, and I think it's a look, a lot of, um, a lot of businesses or some businesses um, want to have a, a retro type of look. And if, you, and if you don't allow neon or severely restrict neon, it takes away that creativity from the designers and um, it's just something that, that it is becoming, and I'll tell you, it's becoming a lost art. Many of the sign companies don't even make neon anymore. It's a, it's a way smaller percentage of sign companies that even are into neon. But it's something I suggest you look at closely and consider versus some um, outright banning, which a number of communities seem to do. But I would look at that closely and um, ask why are we banning it or why not. And just to chime in, the, uh, I, I, I took a track of comparing neon to electronic message centers. There's the LED in like pan channel letters. If you're going to retrofit a neon lit sign with LED, is the LED is going to be a fraction of the power. I mean, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I suspect it's 20% of the power or less uh, with LEDs, and plus the reliability factor is much higher with LEDs. Uh, that said, uh, neon has a charm that LED lit signs do not have. Uh, so if your community is such that it allows exposed neon or, or whatnot, there is a charm associated with that uh, uh, that can certainly uh, be attractive. But in terms of power consumption, it's going to be 20% or less with LED compared to a neon lit channel letter. OK, thanks, Mike, for that clarification. There's another question. We have an interest in uh, an a, a, HOA having a message center, and if we have any recommendations. I would say, as, as we talked about, that in, in that case in particular, since it's a residential area, that um, you know, the square footage, be very carefully determined what's going to fit in there. And, and if you get the brightness regulations correct, such as what, what's suggested in the presentation, you shouldn't have any issues at all. And there was a question on presentation slides. They'll, they'll, they'll be, be available for uh, future reference. I'm not sure what date it'll be posted, but I think fairly soon after this presentation, probably within a couple of days, it'll be posted on the, uh, the webcast consortium website.
And there's one question on um, asking about color temperature in relation to EMCs and how it might affect wildlife. We don't have any, ISA does not have any specific regulations. All I can say is that the color temperature of uh, electronic message center varies substantially based upon the message displayed. Um, so that would be a, a challenge to specifically regulate. But all I can say is from a, um, an impact standpoint with regulations, say you may allow a, a 40 square foot electronic message center, um, the, the amount of light that's being emitted from that sign versus, say, a static sign oftentimes will be less for the electronic message center than a static sign. So it, it uh, depends upon the regulations in place, but chances are the impact would be minimal at best and not that different from a static uh, type of sign. And there's a question in relation to a place of, of worship uh, directly adjacent to family homes. I think I touched on this a little bit, uh, having a reasonable setback, and that varies quite a bit depending upon uh, all the variables as far as um, the square footage allowed and whatnot. But clearly a setback of maybe 100 to uh, 150 or 200 feet maybe, along with um, having in an operational limitation, especially if it's immediately adjacent to single family, past a, a certain time you may want to not have them operating unless there's a, maybe something going on at that place of worship past the, um, the curfew of maybe 10 or 11 o'clock, whatever works in your community. The model regulations that we talked about are available at that link and you'll be able to see that link um, once that is posted in the presentation. So there was a question on where the uh, model regulations are available. There is a question uh, regulating the quality of the display. I would suggest that uh, we've seen jurisdictions um, try to regulate the quality of the display. Uh, we suggest that that be left up to the sign company in relation to the type of resolution. Since um, different applications, say you have someone that has a very short viewing distance, would, would require possibly a higher resolution versus a, a freeway where you have a really uh, long viewing distance um, would require a different type of resolution. It's kind of difficult for a jurisdiction to, regu to properly regulate that. When I've seen it being tried, it does, it, it, it's difficult to come up with regulations that are fair and consistent across the board. There, there is a question if we have on our website at signs.org have examples of different uh, sign lighting levels and that we don't have, um, including um, the, the recommended standards. So that is not available on the website in relation to um, taking a look at different examples. And one thing I would say though is that uh, if even if we did have that information posted, it would be difficult to really see the difference unless, you know, as the ones that we had in the presentation that shows uh, illumination levels that are way too bright, the other ones, um, when they're correctly illuminated, are, are going to be on par with, uh, often with a standard uh, type of traditional sign. Well, this is 
Well, going a little bit off topic, but uh, there's a question in relation to content neutrality and on-premise versus off-premise. Uh, just real briefly, all I can say is that the on-premise and off-premise a distinction that has, that was uh, specifically commented on, uh, not in the majority, but it was commented on um, in the, the Reed versus uh, Tom and Gilbert decision, and it has stood. There has been some challenges to that very question throughout the country. The only state that I'm aware of up to this point that has um, not agreed with allowing to maintain the on and off-premise distinction is Tennessee. Every other uh, circuit or local court that we're aware of has um, followed the Reed versus Town of Gilbert uh, distinction but, and allowing th that distinction to be maintained without violating the Reed decision. So. Now, just one other thing. Um, I think that's it on questions. I didn't. I didn't see anything else. Okay. Christine, could you indicate? Well, if um, yeah. Could, if if that's it, we can wrap up for the day unless you have any other concluding comments from the two of you. Um, actually, there is one more question. Um, in relation to advertisements, let me get to that, okay, because we still have a few minutes. Yeah, that's fine. And really, the, I, the, the question deals with um, by, I think, allowing the electronic message centers that everyone would want one. And in relation to be competitive, how does that work? Um, th there's no easy answer to that, other than we find that in jurisdictions that have had and have allowed electronic message centers for quite some time, every business really doesn't um, need them or want them just because it doesn't fit in with their business model. Um, but I think it's, it's a good question and it's, it's one, it's a concern that we hear often in relation to electronic message centers. And I think the, the key is when they're properly regulated to fit in with your community, um, it's really not going to be um, a whole lot different either aesthetically from what you currently have because it's just allowing a little additional flexibility for that end user to be able to display additional information in relation in relation to uh, what's available or what's for sale at, at that site. So I think that the the differences aren't so dramatic, and it's um, just a matter of your right. It's sub uh, he used the word uh, subjective. It's very subjective in relation to um, you know what is going to work in your community or what isn't going to work. But I think that's something that um, each community has to decide. You know, and that's really the bottom line is aesthetically uh, from an um, operational standpoint, from a square footage standpoint, from you know, the whole time, from all the different aspects that we're talking about, what will work in your community and, um, and if so, exactly how is that going to look on paper. So let's see if there's any more questions before we close it out. Just on that whole, uh, you know, the concept of it, well, everybody will want one kind of along the same line. I've heard in uh, a lot of the sessions that we've done the, the concern like uh, along the lines of if, if, uh, if we allow these, really it's not going to provide a net business increase mm -hmm. for the community. It's just 
one business will cannibalize from another. Let's say if a restaurant gets a message center, it's just going to take from restaurant business from other restaurants in the community. And uh, actually, we, we haven't um, really seen that. For instance, uh, uh, there's a dinosaur resource center in, in Woodland Park, Colorado, and there's not really a large community of dinosaur resource centers out there to cannibalize from each other. Um, but this, this dinosaur resource center installed a message center, and I was doing a session in Woodland Park, Colorado, and he came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, what you talk about here absolutely happened with us. We had a static sign, changed it out to an electronic message center, and our gate receipts went up 20% uh, the day after the uh, uh, sign was installed, and it's maintained that level going forward. So. I mean, they really actually, they, they just are, uh, you know, when, under, when, one try, when one thinks about the economic impact of these signs, they really do have the ability to convey what's actually happening at the property, which can generate interest uh, in the community. There is um, one other question, and it's a really good one. Should a community consider distinguishing between a message that's um, a wall or on a building versus freestanding. Most of the electronic message center installations that are done tend to be on a freestanding sign. A number of jurisdictions allow electronic message centers on wall signs, but typically that's a fairly small percentage, even where it is allowed uh, to be on a building or a wall, just given that it's, it's typically not really visible unless it um, depends on the location. Um, so really, that's just a, a distinction that uh, the community would have to make in relation to allowing them on a wall or not. Uh, um, and it really depends on the district and the context. But most of the installations, I would say over 90, 95%, were, even where they are allowed, and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong on that, are on the freestanding sign. And that other question is really then, um, for, for your community to decide if it's going to work or is it going to be appropriate or does our community want to have it on, on a building or a wall. Okay, is there anything else? I think we're uh, about wrapped up. It's 2.30 now. Um, so again, uh, you'll be able to get a PDF of this presentation um, on our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And um, a video of this will be up on our YouTube channel, um, which is also listed on our webcast webpage. But you can just go to youtube.com and search planning webcast. Um, and so all of the references to um, any of the, the websites, the videos, the links for everything will be embedded in this presentation that you can find on our, on our webcast webpage. So again, uh, thanks to the County Planning Division and to our two speakers today, Mike Freeberg and James Carpentier. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, everyone have a great weekend.